Thank you so much for joining us online today. You're about to watch a message from our series, The Elephant in the Room, where we're tackling some tough questions and subjects that normally aren't talked about in church. If Freedom Church has made an impact in your life, we'd love to hear about that. You can email us at amen at freedomchurch.sc to tell us a little bit about your story. Or if it's had such an impact that you want to help support our ministry financially, you can do that as well by visiting freedomchurch.sc and clicking on the Give tab in the upper right-hand corner. Again, thank you so much for joining us and pray that God will teach you something strong through today's message. Have you ever had questions? You know the types of questions that you're not supposed to talk about in church, but you've always secretly wondered about? Like politics, other religions, and cults, alcohol, homosexuality, sex? Yeah, me too. The elephant in the room. We'll be discussing the taboo topics that you've always wondered about. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Happy New Year. Did you guys have a good New Year? So far? Wow. Weak New Year. Goodness gracious. Must be a lot of Ohio State fans. That must be what is happening there. Um, Do you have a good Christmas? All right. Well, I hope you got stuff good for Christmas. Hey, I got the flu for Christmas. That was fun. I never had gotten that for Christmas before. Maybe I heard some of you did as well. And speaking of Ohio State, I felt like Braxton Hicks, who got, or Braxton Hicks. That's a, all, all the ladies are like that joke. All the men are like, I don't get it. Uh, I felt like Braxton, whatever his name is, that, uh, that I got hit by the Clemson guy. I couldn't walk for about a couple days, but uh, Connie, Connie held the fort down, did a great job, and she told me it was time for me not to be sick anymore, so I, was, uh, I listened and tried to get well, but it was a good, good new year. Hey, we want to start the new year out at Freedom. Before we even kick in uh, to the sermon this weekend, just tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Every year at Freedom Church, we have started the year out with a fast, and now some of you may go, what is a, what is a fast? Here's all, what a fast is, not to be scary. Fasting is simply saying, you know what, I'm going to draw away from something in my life that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy, and is kind of of the, you know, the world a little bit, and not necessarily a bad thing, but just something in the world. I'm going to draw away from that so that I can draw to God and have some time and some energy and, and to really focus in on God. And so it's 2014, so we thought we'll take 14 days and just in this for 14 days, we're going to ask everybody at Freedom Church to fast from something. Now, some people fast from social media. Um, some of you should do that for 365 days. That would be a good idea. But some of you fast, some people fast from Facebook and Twitter and all those things. Some people will fast from TV. Others of you will do a more typical food fast, and maybe you'll fast and just do juice and water for 14 days, or maybe you'll do the Daniel fast, which is just kind of giving up all the sugar and the sweets and, the, and, and stuff and the meat, and you just kind of eat vegetables for a couple of days. Some of you do that all the time, so don't call it a fast if you do that all the time. That's kind of, you know, I'm fasting vegetables for 14 days. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, and so, uh, but for 14 days, just say, you know what, I want to draw away from the world. And in order to do that, I want to give up something that will remind me, minute by minute almost, that I'm going to do this. Uh, and so, so we want to ask you to do that. And we want it to be a personal 14 days. We're not asking you to pray for anything for the church. You can pray for the church. We'd love you to. Um, but really, we want it to be a time where you set up yourself for 2014 being the year of you digging deeper into the Bible and learning more about God and becoming more like Jesus. So starting tomorrow until 14 days from then, which will be Sunday the 19th, um, you, you can do that, and that would be something great for you to do. Speaking of praying for the church and for praying for... Um, you know, specifically for, for myself and for Connie and the other elders, I thought it's 2014, we're entering a new year, we've had a lot of new people, I thought this would be a great time for you to get to meet our elders, and just so you'll know who they are. So just real quickly, I'm going to ask our elders if they'll come up on stage, and I'll introduce you to them so you can know who the leaders um, of the day-to-day -day operations of our church are. First of all, this is Pastor Robbie Foreman, and Robbie is our assisting pastor, and Robbie uh, does this a lot of stuff, helps me in a lot of areas. You'll see him leading worship. Um, you will see him uh, on the missions front. <laughs> Someone may want to get me a water. That'd be good. <laughs> this is Pastor Cody Burbage um, in December <clears throat> Y'all talk amongst yourselves for just a moment here while I die, all right, just for a second. We were able to pray over Cody in December, 
and uh, he became an elder, been an elder in training for a while, and so that was a great thing there. This has been my life for the last 12 days, by the way, so welcome to Connie's Reality. Hey, um, this is a special elder to me. Our first elder that we um, had beside myself, we kind of came together as our first elders at Freedom. And uh, if you guys don't know, this is Pastor Hal West. Uh, he has been at Fort Johnson Baptist Church in uh, West Ashley, James Island, rather, area uh, for the last two years. But we are glad we have him back this weekend, and not just this weekend, every weekend. So welcome back, Pastor Hal, for me, if you guys would. Um, Pastor Hal's been behind the scenes the whole time as one of our elders, prays for me, and, you know, I know these guys, I don't know if they're praying for me or not, but I know Pastor Hal is praying for me, and I just have loved having him as a friend over the last two and a half years, and now I'm glad to have you back with us, and you'll see him out in the foyer a lot as he's going to be just helping us uh, with uh, all of our connections and things that happen out there, so excited about that. And then, this is... Uh, our elder, Scott Ferguson. If you don't know Scott, then that means you're probably not in the community group, and you should get in the community group because Scott oversees our uh, community groups, does a great job. We have an amazing community group system and some great community group leaders, and Scott has trained each of them, poured into them, and just does a wonderful job. So would you guys give it up for them? Pray for them. That's right. Pray for them. Pray for their families. And then um, I, Connie and I meet with them once a month. We discuss what's going on with the church. We pray about what's going on in the church. And we, we're excited to be on the same team with these men and their wives. So, so thank them as they, they leave. Well, we're going to start a new series now. That we've gone through a couple of things just to kind of set up the new year. And this, this series is great for the new year as well. And I'll t tell you why. Now, now typically... Um, on a new year, you'll see it. a church will do a series, you know, four ways to, to, to start the new year right and four areas that you can work on in your life. And those are all good things. You know, start a new year, new you, you know, new with God, you know, those kind of series. And, and those are great. And, and we may do that in 2015. We've, we've done that before. But this year, as, as we were praying through really, uh, you know, what we should start the year off with, I just had this, this sense that we need to do something a little different. And the reason was is because what I've seen is that we have really grown as a church. We really have, and, and, and it's been an amazing journey to watch. But one of the things that I think is the next step for us is to really grow in um, just kind of how we, we know and read and study and, and, and use the Bible in our lives. And so we decided, what, what's a better way? than to really study how to use the Bible in your life and how to know the Bible and study the Bible, than to look at some controversial topics and go, okay, what does the Bible have to say about those topics? And so we're starting a series called The Elephant in the Room. And for four weekends, we're just going to look at some really controversial topics, maybe things that, that you've got some, some, some uh, things you believe about or things you think you believe, and we're going to unpack them. But as we do that, we're going to unpack them in such a way that helps us to be able to learn how how to study the Bible and use the Bible in our everyday lives. And so we want to make 2014 the year of the Bible at Freedom Church. In fact, I want to encourage you to uh, get a version reading plan or maybe a devotional if you still use paper books. And, and you can read the Bible and get a plan together and make this the year that you study the Bible more than any other time in your lives. And, and here's why. Because statistics tell us that people who attend church, and not just people who say they're Christians, people who attend church, about 20% of them would say that last year they read the Bible in any sustainable way at all. About 20%. So about 80% of people who attend church regularly don't read the Bible. I would say that's probably true for about 80% of you if you were to be really, really honest. That is, I talk to our community group leaders, one of the things I hear is that, man, we're growing in our relationship, we're, we're really growing, but actually getting them to, to read the Bible is tough. It's a tough thing. So we wanted to push in and show you why it should be such a high priority. And so we're going to talk about some subjects that, that are fun to talk about and find out what the Bible says. In fact, before you leave, would you grab a couple of these? This is a great invite. It's just a little bag of peanuts. Got a little invite card on it. You can hand it to somebody and go, hey, we're talking about some stuff at church that is not normally talked about. Would you, would, you ought to come to church. It's a great way to get people to come to church unless they're allergic to peanuts and then you would kill them. So don't do that unless you know they're not allergic to peanuts. All right, so, but you've probably heard the saying that, that there's three things you just never talk about in, in mixed company and 
in crowds, but I mean, it's just politics, religion, and money. You just don't talk about those subjects. It's a southern rule that you just leave those alone. It is, those are the elephant in the room. You, you, just, you just kind of ignore that they're there. Yet, if you think about it, these three topics, along with just a few other kind of taboo subjects, really um, comprise some of the most important discussions that you can ever have with someone. I mean, if you leave out politics, religion, and money, you're not going to have a lot of substantive conversations with anyone. In fact, if you never talk about these subjects, your relationship would be kind of dull with, with people and, and unmoving and, and probably pretty average. In fact, I would say that a lot of churches avoid talking about any of these subjects that are a little bit taboo, that, that maybe will ruffle some feathers just a little bit. And, and in doing that, they create a climate in, that sometimes is a little bit you know, unmoving and a little bit dull and a little bit boring because you just talk about the safe subjects. So over the next few weekends, we're going to look at some controversial topics. We're, we're going to talk about some things that maybe you have never heard talked about in church and maybe really didn't think you ever would hear talked about in church. Like, like we're going to say, what does the Bible have to say about religion? You, you know, you say, never talk about religion with people, and yet every week we stand up here and tell you, identify three people. Give them a bag of peanuts. Talk about your faith with them. Tell them about Jesus. Talk about religion at work. How about this? Can a Christian uh, chew tobacco while he's in a tree stand shooting Bambi? I mean, can, can that happen? Can, can you do that? And then can he have a Sam Adams after he's done killing Bambi in the tree stand to celebrate? Is that, is that okay while he watches God sport college football? I mean, is that possible that that can happen? Another, here, here's another we're going to talk about. Does God vote? Does he vote? And if he does, surely God is a Republican, right? I mean, he's got to be a Republican, or no, 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 God's not a Republican because he, he's compassionate and loves people, so he is a Democrat. He's got to be a Democrat because he has compassion for people. How would God vote? What do we do about politics in the church? Do we just ignore it, or does the Bible have something to say about this? And if this isn't fun enough stuff, on week four, we're going to talk about sexuality. What about homosexual marriage? What, what about hookups? What about, and some of you may go, I don't even know, why would we talk about this? I'll tell you why. Because your college age kids are. What about friends with benefits? What do, we, what do we do? What does the Bible say about sexuality? And I want to warn you, four weeks in advance, and we'll warn you every week, and then we'll warn you right before it comes up. That's definitely going to be a PG, maybe 13, 14, 15, 16, you make the decision in your family type of sermon. We're going to talk, you know, in, in blunt ways about what the Bible has to say about sexuality. And so you'll, you'll want to be here that week, and you'll want to make sure that your 11-year-old is not in here that week. And so that, that's going to be fun, though. Now, 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 there's a couple ways that people typically address these kind of subjects. The first way, and this is a lot of people in the church especially, is resistance to any new thoughts. Just like, hey, you know what? I have made my mind up um, one way or the other. Uh, it may be not be through any Bible knowledge or actual wisdom, but you, you made your mind up, and this is what you're, you're sticking to it no matter what. And, and some people on both sides of the issue, of any of these issues, would fall into this resistance category that's just a new idea. Hey, this is what I believe. I've always believed it. My prayer for you is that you would allow the Holy Spirit and God's Word to confirm or deny your, your thoughts. Like, why do you believe what you believe? Like, it's great to believe. You need to have beliefs. You need to stand firm on what you believe. But why do you believe what you believe? And, and so, that's the first way. This, the second way is that oftentimes we'll, have, we'll be reliant on someone else's thought. In, in other words, you have a thought but, but the truth is, you have no idea why you believe it. But it's what you've always thought is true. And so anything to the contrary you say is wrong because my mama believed this, my daddy believed this, her mama before her believed this, her daddy before her believed this, and preacher so-and-so told me this is the way it was. And so this is what I believe. And in fact, you would say, somebody somewhere told me that this says this in the Bible. I've never read it with my own eyes. But I believe them because I trust them, and so that's what I believe. You're not going to change my mind. 
just a reliance on someone else. That's all. Here's what we'd like to do is over this series, just teach you how to make decisions based on reading the Bible. How to make decisions based on going, okay, what did Jesus really have to say about this subject? Because there are some things that people have told you over the years or that you've heard was in the Bible that just isn't. And if you'll read the Bible, sometimes you'll be surprised about what it does and does not say and how it can affect your life. Here's one. God helps those who helps themselves. You guys ever heard that? A lot of American Christians especially believe that's in the Bible. I've heard people quote this scripture before. They go, well, I'm not going to help them in this. I don't think we ought to reach out to the poor because God helps those who help themselves. That is actually about the most anti-gospel thing that's ever been said. It's not in the Bible because the gospel, right, the gospel actually says God helps those who can't help themselves at all, like ever. So, so that's not in the Bible. You, maybe you thought it was. Here's one. This is going to get a lot of you. You thought this was in the Bible. Spare the rod. Spoil the child. It's in, you know, Hevathatiah 3 2. That is what you thought. That's where it's at. You say something that doesn't sound like a Bible and you just go, that's where it is. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It never says anything about sparing the rod and you'll spoil the child. It just doesn't say it. Now, here's what the Bible actually does say. It's a little harsher, actually. It says, the one who withholds the rod hates his son. So then you take that on. It's a, lot, a little less than spoiling, I guess. But um, you hate your children if you don't rod them, is what the Bible actually says. All right. Here's one. I love this one. I actually heard this one recently from, from somebody that, that I really, really respect. And I know that they, that they just they didn't know. They know. Here's it. God works in mysterious ways. It's got to be in the New Testament somewhere. It's got to say that. Nope, nope. Actually, English poet uh, by the name of William Cowper, who wrote that in a poem. It's great for prose and poetry, but if you like that kind of stuff, but it's just, just, it's not in the Bible. And now here's one that's really, you know, I I probably quoted this one a couple times, thought it was in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's got to be in Proverbs somewhere. I mean, got to be, but it's not. It's um, John Wesley, great preacher, great man of God but not God. Doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. So, so here, because here's the deal. In 20 plus years now of pastoring people, here's what I find, is that arrogant biblical ignorance is one of the problems that plague the church. Just this, this arrogance that says, in, in other words, I don't read the Bible, but I have a ton of opinions on what it says. Like, I've never actually studied the Bible, but let me quote to you what I think that it says, and let me form my opinions based on the Bible, but I don't actually read it. It's, a, it's an arrogant biblical ignorance. That, that, that I just kind of know what it says because it's been passed down to me. In fact, we, we live in what is perhaps the most biblically ignorant society that has ever been. I mean, in in past, people knew the Bible a lot more than they know now. Schools oftentimes were, you know, in churches, and they studied the Bible in school. And so you grew up, whether you lived it or not, you at least had a knowledge of the Bible. But we live in this very biblically ignorant society. But but the truth is, is we have the most access to the Bible of any society that has ever been. We have access to you version, every translation that has ever been translated right on your phone right now. You could get to it. I used to when I was in seminary, which wasn't that long ago. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not that old. And when I was in seminary, I had to have shelves and shelves and shelves of books. Connie can remember, we moved nine times in three years while I was in the seminary time. And we would move those books around over and over again. Now, on my iPad, I have access to every commentary that's ever been written. I have access through Logos, the software that I have on my iPad, to every sermon that's just about as ever been on any sermon, that every book written on every subject. I can get to it. I can study the Greek. I can study the Hebrew right there. And we have access to it, and yet we are a biblically ignorant society. So, so here's our goal. We're going to take an authentic, real look at a few tough subjects from the Bible. With, with, here's what we're going to have, a little unity in the essential beliefs. We're going to find some unity and go, okay, we can see on this subject there's a lot, of, a lot of room, a lot of area, but here's some unity we can have on some essentials of what we see that the Bible definitely teaches. And, and, and in other words, what does the Bible definitely say? And then we're going to have a whole lot of liberty on the non-essentials, just the things that we just don't know. 
Just, we just we don't have an answer to it. We're going to find the liberty. And what we can all agree to disagree on for the sake of the cause of Christ. And in the end, we'll own the gospel even more. And then here's what we're going to do too. During the midst of all this, we're going to discover every week just kind of some some, some theology and some principles about how do you study the Bible and use that in your real life, like every day. Like how do you use it? How do you make decisions every single day based on it? So, so you game, look at some tough subjects, learn about studying the Bible, learn what Jesus really has to say about some subjects. You, you, you good to go? All right. About 20% of you, you're the ones who read the Bible. All right, let's go. In, in the midst of all of this, we're going to be discussing first and foremost this week is religion. We're not supposed to talk about religion. You, you can't talk about religion at work, right? I mean, you can't do that, especially if you make duck calls for a living. Like, you just can't talk about religion. You can't talk about religion if you work at the grocery store. You, you can't do that. It's, it's kind of a rule. It's the elephant in the room. And, and then there's a reason why. I, I think there's a real reason why people don't want to hear us talk about religion. And it's kind of, I've titled this sermon, uh, this, because this is the reason, is it says, Jesus, I love you, but I hate your followers. And that is the common sentiment or statement of those who are far from God these days. The reason they don't want us to talk about religion is because over and over again, they have been beat down with um, biblically, er arrogantly, biblically ignorant statements. They've been beat down with things that, that are a list of rules and religion to the point where they go, I don't want you to talk about it. It's like, you know what, I, I love the church. I love God. And some of them would say, I even like Jesus. I think he's a great guy. But, oh, the church. Now, for those of us who are part of the church, that's kind of like saying to a man, you know, going to a man and going, hey, I want to be friends, man. I really, I really like you. But your wife... She's ugly and she stinks a lot. I mean, so that's, that's just, we're just not going to be around her because we are the bride of Christ, right, the church. And so we know that, but for people who are far from God, they're going, you know what, I just, I don't have anything to do with the church because that's where people are. They've been hurt by religion. And so we need to talk about religion and why does it hurt people? Want to know why people don't like to talk about religion? Because it oftentimes has been ugly and it has smelled a little. I mean, it really has been ugly. To a lot of you, I've heard your story. The reason you were far from church was not as much as you were far from God. You've just been hurt by the church, been hurt by people in the church. You've been hurt by a, a system of rules and regulations, and you never felt the love that came with the Jesus that you've heard about. And you say, I found a home at freedom because I finally found the, the real true meaning of that love. And so that is true. It just is true that the religion has often done that. So, so let's take a look at, at what I mean by this by turning, if you will, to Colossians. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Colossians. Feel free to look at it on your smart device as well. Um, we're going to look at the second chapters where we're going to kind of land. In the book of Colossians in the first chapter, um, this is a letter from Pastor Paul. He was the pastor of their church in Colossae, and it's written to Christians. And we need to note that because it's important to know um, who books are written to and that as Paul is writing this book, he's not writing it to people far from God. He's writing it to people who really are growing and maturing, and he wants to help them and their followers of Jesus. In the first chapter, he does, as Paul often does, he, he thanks God for them. He reminds them about Jesus, as Paul always does. He reminds them of what they used to be before the Gospels. He says, look, this is what your life used to look like. This is who you used to be. And he, he reminds them of that. And then the end of chapter 1, moving into chapter 2, he says, and look, I have, I've suffered a lot. And I've had a lot of pain in my life. A lot of discouragement in my life, Paul says. But here's why. Because I want you to grow, he says to his church. I, I want you to mature. I don't want you to falter. And, and this is what I'd say to Freedom Church. It is, you know, in 2013, we, 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 I mean, we had some great growth. But as the pastor in this, this seat that I sit in, I also saw the people who started the year excited and with us and they, they walked away. I saw the people that dropped out of community group. And I saw the people who faltered in their faith. And it's discouraging sometimes. It's so hard. It's the 
kind of the, the just the byline of ministry is that you get to see all the stuff for all the people. And what I would say to you as your pastor is, I want you to grow. I want you to mature. I want you to not falter. And I really believe in order to do that, it's going to be pressing in to, to your relationship with God for these 14 days. Start the, start the fast and press in. It's going to be finding you know, how to read the Bible and study it and apply it to your life. In, in long obedience, in the same direction. I want to see the end of 2014, you'd still be with us. And, and, and I don't want to be discouraged watching you walk away. And so Paul says, he says, I want you to grow and mature. And then look, in chapter 2, picking up with verse 2, he talks about this thing, religion. And it's going to go through chapter 5. He says, look, I want that your hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding. You want to have the best year you can have? I mean, you want the best to be yet to come? 2014 to be an incredible year? He says, look, here's how you do it. I want, I want it to be done. I want love to reach all the riches and the full assurance of understanding and, and the knowledge of God's mystery. He says, look, here's what, I'll, here's what you got to do if you want that. I want you to really understand God. Not a reliance upon an old belief that you have a resistance to any new thing. Not just saying this is what I've always believed and I'll always believe it. Not a resistance to learning more and new things. But, but I want your spirit man to connect to the mystery of God, to the, to the spirit of God. And that's what I desire for Freedom Church this year, is that we would, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God, that we would connect to God in a new way in the mystery of God, in the, which he says, which is Christ. The mystery is Jesus, Paul says. It's, it's no mystery any longer, except there is so much we still don't know about Jesus. He says, I want you to learn more about Jesus. I want you to draw closer to Jesus. I want you to know what Jesus really said. I want to remind you of what Jesus did in your life. There is stuff that we can't even begin to learn, he's saying, until we are committed to learning and to unlearning. I want you to, during this series, I want you to open your minds up just a little bit and go, okay, I want to learn what Jesus really said. I want to be able to stand on something that's so firm because I know it's what God teaches me in Scripture, not because it's what I've always learned. And I want my whole life to be filled with that. And then he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you want to find wisdom for this new year? You want to find knowledge for this new year? You want the treasure of a life that's more abundant this new year? He says, you find that in the mystery of Jesus. You get to know him better. You learn what he really said, not what someone else said he said in a book. What did he say? And you dig into that. And then look at this. I, I love this. And he says, this speaks to religion. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He uses this interesting phrase. Plausible arguments. You see, this phrase, plausible arguments, in, in other words, that these are not ridiculous things that these people are trying to persuade the church with. They're plausible. They're believable. So there was this group of people that came to the church at Colossae, and they said, look, here, here's what you've learned, but it's a little different than that. Here's what you think about things, but no, 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 it's a, it's a little different than that. They had these believable, plausible arguments that they had always believed and that they were teaching to the church. And Paul says, in order to say that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. See, in the Colossian religious culture, there were various false teachers, more or less, who subscribed to traditional Christian ideas and theology. So for the most part, they, they really subscribed to what Jesus was about. They were Jews who had kind of seen that there, this Christianity was really rising up, and they saw something in it. But they said, no, no, wait a minute, though. I know what you've learned from Paul. I know what you've learned from the scriptures that you have. I know what you've learned from Jesus, 
but, but we're going to make this fit into the old traditions of religion. And so these Jewish Christians said, we're going to keep the religion as well as Jesus. So it's going to be just these old traditions with a twist. They just added minor differences or made a tweak here or there to add a different teaching, to add a little spin on everything so to what the Colossians had already believed. And Paul says, look, don't get caught up in these plausible arguments. And here's what happens. If you don't study the Bible, religion will give you an answer, but oftentimes it's not biblically based, and it's a plausible argument. It makes a lot of sense. It says this is what you should be about. This is what you should build your, your kind of your foundation on. This is what you should use your platform for. But then if you read the Bible, you go, wait a minute, Jesus wasn't about that at all. It's a plausible argument, but it's not Christianity is just religion. So Paul says, though, that there is an antidote to religion. He says religion builds everything upon these plausible arguments. Religion adds on and, and kind of twists things. But he said there's something different. Look at what Paul says in verse 6. He says, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding. In thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive, the religious people, by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He says, look, don't let what has always been the traditional view of everything drive you. Make sure you know what Jesus has to say about it. For in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. What he's saying in verse 11 is, look, you have these rituals, these religious rituals. One of them was circumcision. And there's nothing that will kill an adult revival like adult male circumcision. You just tell a, bu a bunch of adult males that they have to get circumcised, and the attendance goes down really, really fast. He says, but that's not what it's about. It's about a circumcision of the heart. It's about Jesus doing something different in your life. He says it's, it's something totally different than the rituals. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, listen, he says, you who were dead in your trespasses and your uncircumcised flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses. So God did something new in you. Remember what God did, he says. It wasn't through religion. It wasn't through rules. It wasn't through the old rituals. It was through Jesus. What did he do? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. In other words, he put down religion and brought up something new. And Paul says, let's talk about religion a little bit. Let's talk about the fact that you are have some people among you that want to drive you back to the performing that comes with religion. You have some people amongst you that want to drive you back to the pretending that comes with religion. And he's saying, don't do it because you know where you came from. Paul is saying, listen, you're doing great. You're growing. You're maturing. You get it. Like, this is a great church, and I would say to you at Freedom Church, we are growing. We are maturing. We get it. And it's about this time in your walk that religion wants to take over because it doesn't want you to grow anymore. It doesn't want you to mature anymore. It doesn't want any new thoughts and new ideas coming in that break away the rites and the rituals of the past. It wants to say, no, this is the way we do it because religion fails every time. But Jesus always wins. And so the reason we walk away is we build on religion, and religion doesn't last. And so I would say to Freedom Church, the same as Paul said to the church of Colossians, don't let religion ruin your relationship with God. And it can do it. The reason you get excited, the, the reason people start coming and they go, man, 
I've never been this excited about church before, and I hear your story. The reason 114 of you were baptized and you started afresh, the reason that, that, that all this is you're inviting friends is because of a relationship. It's something that Jesus did in you, and now he wants to do something through you. And what will kill that is when you let religion ruin it. And you go, what are the rules? I need, I need some rules. What, what do I need to do? What do I need to not do? No, no. Get close to Jesus. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you are like him. And the closer you are to him, the, the more you act like him. Second is don't let religion become your righteousness. You see, oftentimes Paul knew this because he had done it himself, is we will say, look, this is, I'm a good religious guy. I'm, I'm a good church-going guy. I'm a good Bible-reading guy. I'm a good obey-the-rules guy. That's my righteousness. That's where my righteousness is built. And he's saying, no, it's Jesus. You're not righteous. None of you are righteous, but Jesus is, and he paid the price for you through the gospel of dying on the cross. That The Bible says, and it's from that same, he was raised from the dead, and we have that same power. He says, don't let religion become your righteousness because it will fail you every time. You know why people don't want to talk about religion? Because religion has failed them. But you tell them about your relationship with, with a God who's changed your life and healed your marriage and is growing you and maturing you, and you now get it. Now that, that's something different. Third thing is don't let religion relegate Jesus to rules. If when you think about Jesus, all you think about is a list of rules, you haven't met Jesus. He, he came to not have a list of rules, but it was a love relationship. He, he loves us. He cares for us. He has things that he wants us to do. He has things he doesn't want us to do, and you can find out what those are when you read the Bible, but that's not his love for you. He's not based on that. See, Jesus is far more than a list of rules as religion is, and Paul says, remember Jesus. Now, how do we do this, though, in real life? Because religion, it always comes up empty. The reason people walk away from church is not because of Jesus. The reason people walk away from church is not even because of church hurts them. The reason people walk away from church is religion, and religion stinks. And so it's, how, how, do we, how do we learn, though? How do we make decisions in our life if we don't have a set of rules? How do we make decisions in our life what the Bible says about things? Here, here's where we're going to get just for five minutes. If you can give me about five minutes, we're going we're gonna to dive into two theological principles that I'm going to give you an easy way to remember them. And now you can study the Bible with these principles in mind. And I'll show you an example of how they can help you know what the Bible says about things. The first way that people sometimes read the Bible is called the normative principle. Here's what the normative principle is. It's the green light principle. In other words, it's green light until you see a red light. So you can do anything you want to do unless the Bible says you can't. You, you don't have to do anything unless the Bible says you have to. And so the normative principle says we look for what the Bible says, and if it doesn't say we can't, we get a green light. It's just green light thinking. So I can do anything I want to do. Pot is legal in Colorado. I can smoke pot because it doesn't say I can't do it in the Bible. It says every seed-bearing plant is good and that God made them. That's a good seed. It's legal. Toke away. That's what the green light principle says. It says the Bible doesn't say I can't smoke pot. All right, so green light. There's some strengths to the green light principle, normative principle. The first is it sees the Bible as principles, but it gets flexibility around the method. So it says, look, here's what a worship service looks like in the Bible. We have some flexibility around that because it doesn't say we can't have electric guitars. It just doesn't have electric guitars because they didn't have electricity. So, so it gives some flexibility in our methods. We don't have to be stuck to a Levitical worship and worship just like Aaron did because we have a different culture than Aaron because it allows for cultural contextualization. So the normative principle says that green light thinking says, all right, I can think about the culture. What was the culture then? What's the culture now? The, the third thing is it really sets us up to treat gathered and scattered worship the same. If you, if you have a green light thinking, you begin as a church to kind of look the same as you do during the week. Because you approach life with green light thinking. You don't go, well, the Bible doesn't say to brush your teeth, so I'm not going to brush my teeth. Like, the, that's just, I'm not going to do it. You brush your teeth because you assume the Bible wants you to have good teeth, right? I mean, so you just, you just do that. So you live your life in the normative principle. You, you don't go, well, there's no cars in the Bible, so I'm going to walk everywhere. I'm not going to drive a car. You, you live life in the normative principle. So, so you begin to look a lot like 
you know, your normal life. The, the weaknesses, though, of this green light thinking is it can go too far, and it can allow for what we'd call pagan syncretism. And what, basically what that means is we sync up with society. And so we, we look a lot like society. We look a lot like, um, you know, everything kind of looks the same, smells the same, tastes the same. We do the same things. We participate in the same activities. It, it can also begin to be and make our life and our worship and everything for our enjoyment and not God's pleasure. And so really it becomes kind of idolatry because it's like, well, I can do anything I want to. Whatever feels good, whatever makes me happy, as long as it's not in the Bible, I can do that. I can participate in it because the Bible doesn't directly forbid it. It it can kind of evaluate unbiblical or elevate rather unbiblical elements to the point where they kind of squeeze out biblical elements in our lives. So that's kind of the weaknesses. That's the the green lighter normative principle. The, The second is... The regulative principle is what it's called. You you don't need to remember that, but you can remember red light. It's the red light. And basically it says, look, we start with a red light. Unless the Bible says to do it, we don't do it. And so the Bible never says that women can wear pants. And so women don't wear pants. You've been around those type of churches probably. The Bible doesn't say that you can do this, and so we start with a red light. Now, there's some strengths. It seeks to define life by God and His Word. And because of that, another strength is it tries to honor the Bible, and it holds the Bible with high esteem. So when you have the regulative principle or the red light principle in your life, you go, I'm going to live by what the Bible says to do. That's what I'm going to do. And it also, it draws a ditch between the world and the church keeping out syncretism and, and syncing up with the world and worldliness and, and kind of paganism out. But, but the problem is, is that ditch is really, really a hindrance to people coming into the church. Because if you don't obey all the rules we have set up and do all the things and live like us, you can't get across the ditch. And so it's a strength, but it's also its first weakness. And it sort of separates out the gathered and the scattered worship. And so life, when gathered in churches that kind of do the regulative principle a lot, it looks a lot different. Like you go to those churches, you go, how do these people look during the week? Like what do they do during the week? Because they're really, really odd at, at church. And, and so there's these two different worlds that people live in, a church world and a, a non-church world. The, the other thing is it's not sufficient to just read the Bible from a red light standpoint because it doesn't answer the questions about technology and clothing and I mean, what kind of seating do we have in a church? How do we worship in a church? Can we use, you know, electricity in the church and different things? It just doesn't, it's not sufficient. And so because of that, it becomes legalistically applied. And what happens when legalism gets into people's lives and into the church is you get really goofy rules. Like really strange things start to happen. That You've got to wear this certain hat have you ever noticed that really religious people always have hats? Like, do they wear different hats? You, you've got to wear certain clothes. You can't do certain things because the Bible doesn't speak about it. Like, I mean, and not making fun of them, and it's for them, but there are churches who have no musical instruments because the Bible doesn't talk about electricity. And so you get kind of goofy, kind of kind of strange. But So there should be a middle ground, right? Not the red light thinking and where you kind of wait till the Bible tells you can do it, and there's cultural problems with that. And not a green light thinking where you just go, hey, if the Bible doesn't say it, we can do it, whatever. You know, it goes. It's got to be something in the middle. How about a yellow light thinking where, where we pause and we pray and, and we consider? What if we were to say, you know what, we're going to just, we're going to pause for a little bit. We're going to read the Bible. We're going to see what the Bible says. We're going to gain that wisdom, that understanding, that treasure of the mystery. We're going to pray about it and see. We're going to consider what the rest of the Bible has to say about other principles and apply those to this. And then we're going to act based on what we learn. Let me give you an example that maybe some of you have have heard about recently and maybe thought about. So we could say this. How big can my house be? Right? I mean, maybe you've heard somebody dealing with this. How big can a pastor's, how big can a Christian's house be? 
Now, if we go to the regulative principle, we go, all right, we got to figure out how many square feet or can it be in the Bible. We look in the Bible, we go, we got to see, does it tell us we can have a house? Well, in the Bible, some people had houses, some people didn't have houses. Some Christians, you know, Solomon had the largest house ever built. Some were nomads. Abraham kind of moved around, just put up a shack every now and then. So it doesn't give us a whole lot on that. And so we go, okay, well... That's going to be tough to apply the red light thinking to this because we don't really know what it says. But so, okay, let's go to green light thinking. The Bible doesn't tell us what the number should be of how big my house should be. And and so if that's the case, then it can go anywhere. Anything I want to do, any size I want to have because the Bible doesn't speak to it, green light thinking, go. Build anything you want to have. Here's what yellow light would say in this principle and how you apply the Bible to everyday decisions in your life. You, You go this, well, what does the Bible have to say about money? And this will help us decide because you buy houses with what? Money. And so you go, okay, all right, well, here's the first thing the Bible says about money. It says that I should tithe. If I'm a Christian, I should tithe. And so if I have a thousand square foot house, but in order to afford it, I cannot tithe, then my house is too big. Does that make sense? So Because we see what else the Bible has to say. So that, so that you can start to apply that. And you go, what else does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says that I am not to be a slave to the lender. Now, a lot of times people will take that a little bit out of context and say you should never have any debt. I don't know that if we put it in context, that's really what the Bible is saying. I think what the Bible is saying is don't be, literally be a slave to your debt. And so what that would mean is, okay, I got this house. But man, if I get the flu and miss a week of work, not making this month's mortgage payment. In fact, I'm about a month behind already, but they don't send you a letter till you're a full month behind, so I'm just kind of keeping it going. It's a slave to the lender. Your house is too big. I don't care how big it is. It's too big. So you use other principles in the Bible. What, what other principle does the Bible have about money? It says we should be generous. So we should be generous with our money. If my house is the size that I cannot be generous with my money to give to other people in times of need, to be able to give to other things going on in the church beyond my tithe and to support organizations that I believe in. If I can't be generous and pay for a meal because I've got this huge house that I just can barely afford, then my house is too big. And see, if you use the Bible that way, then you go, wait a minute. So the Bible doesn't give me an exact number because what regulative red light thinking says is, give me a number. And what I will often ask people is, okay, well, what's your number? Is 2,000 square feet too big? Oh, no, 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 that's okay. So how about three? Oh, it's getting kind of big. Four? Mm, Yeah, that's probably too big. All right, so 3,999, that's okay? Well, I don't know know about it. See, it's got to be a number. When it's regulative, you got to get a number. can't just be like whatever's right with you and the Holy Spirit for my house, right? But so now the regulative doesn't work. The green light doesn't work because it's not considering what God really wants for our life. Or just, I can do anything I want to. But when we pray about it, we consider, then we go, wait a minute, how can I use this? We have some friends who um, very successful authors have sold millions of copies of books. Because of that, they have a really nice house. It really is. It's a large house, a nice house. And, and here's how I see it play out in their life. There's always someone living with them, staying with them, coming in for a couple of weeks. In fact, one time they moved to a different house, and so they had two houses that were really close to one another, both of them really large, really nice. They let a single mom stay in the other house for about two years, rent free. They said, to stay in our house. We can afford it because God's given us this amazing blessing. You see, God uses that in an incredible way. Are they being generous? Yes. Do they tithe? Yes. Are they a slave to the lender? No, they own them. It's it's a whole different world. It's not about the size of the house. It's about the size of your heart and how God's using it. And so we use the Bible not to build a list of rules and regulations that weigh us down as religion. We use the Bible to go, how can I be more like Jesus? And in being more like Jesus, what will that make me, what decisions will that cause me to make? And when we do that, I think it's attractive. I think people look at that and go, okay, wait a minute, huh? I can get with that. So you you don't have a list of the way I have to live my life because that's what you believe. Okay. You you don't just say anything goes. That seems, I mean, even to the non-believer, it's fun at first, but eventually they go, wait a minute. There's got to be something here more substantive than that. You know, we consider, we pray, and then we act. And I believe if we live that way, that, that God will change us. Because all the Christian life is ceaseless worship of God the Father. 
through the mediatorship of God the Son who died on the cross, by the indwelling power of God the Spirit, doing what God commands in Scripture. We always do what God commands. Not doing what God forbids. We never do what He forbids. In culturally contextualized ways for the furtherance of the gospel when both gathered for adoration and scattered for action. That's how we apply the Bible to our lives. That's not religion. That's a relationship. Your friends, they're going to want some of that. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you give us the Bible. That we don't have to guess, God. You give us principles in Scripture. You loved us enough to tell us what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And you make it very clear, God. And then you give us the Holy Spirit to give us wisdom in other areas to decide what is right for our situation. And so, God, I pray that we would not leave relationship for religion. God, I pray that we would not allow our righteousness to be built on religion, but it would be built on you, Jesus. And I pray, God, that through your Holy Spirit, we would see Jesus for what he is, which is a loving Savior and not a list of rules. God, I pray we'd start our new year with this, this love of your word, this love of who you are. And that as we do that, God, you would teach us, you would grow us, you would mature us in Jesus' name.